Hello everyone and welcome to another beer review. Now, today we're back on the kegs again because we've got a few of them to get through. So we're back on a Thornbridge keg and uh, this is quite an interesting one because it's a type of beer that I like, which is a bitter. And I do like a bitter. Now, although the brewery is in class as a Derbyshire postcode. It's a heck of a lot closer to Sheffield than it is to Derby in the location of the actual brewery. So in my mind it's probably closer to a Yorkshire better than really what we call a Derbyshire better, better from that point of view if there is one. But what we're doing is a better and uh, I've got to admit with a Thornbridge brewery um, because maybe people don't realise this I class Thornbridge more of a craft brewery so a lot of times it doesn't really focus on my radar so much so it's not a brewery i think of if, if somebody says thornbridge the two beers i think about from thornbridge is jaipur which is a kind of famous kind of pale ale very hoppy and of course they're kind of that coco wonderland which is their kind of uh, porter which again is kind of slightly crafty and kind of Kind of over accentuated flavours, which is, of course is kind of the norm of craft beer. So I don't really kind of think of them when I think about kind of more traditional styles of beer. And previously we've done a golden ale, which was actually quite nice. Today we're doing a better, and of course we will be having a porter coming up. But today we're doing Lord Marples, which is named after a person who isn't a lord or wasn't a lord, but thought he should have been and acted if he was, apparently. So there you go. But this is more of a traditional beer, and I thought I'd put it in a more traditional glass, because some people have been complaining that they don't particularly like Ponzi glasses. They like more kind of traditional glasses, like this. So for you, Slurpy Dave, I've put it into a traditional glass. And I hope you appreciate it. And hopefully it makes the beer taste better as well. Because again, a lot of times, especially the Belgians, the Belgians believe in specific glasses for specific types of beer. And of course, a few kind of craft breweries kind of follow suit. They claim that. Because in some beers, they rely on the aroma as well as the taste to kind of provide the final kind of drinking experience. A bit like checks with foam, they use different kind of levels of foam to give a different drinking experience of the same beer, and that's why you can have it with very little foam or nearly all foam, but a quarter of the glass is beer and the rest of it's foam. So of course, there's different ways of drinking beer, but the Belgians believe that, especially in more aromatic beers, that it changes the flavour and adds accents to the flavour if people are getting more of the aroma or able to get more of the aroma as they actually drink and draw in the beer into the mouth. If they're also getting a chance to bring in aromas at the same time, then of course it changes the kind of character of the beer, which, which is true because a lot of times if you're getting aromas, sometimes you start associating flavors with the beer that aren't actually there they're actually from the aromas but you're starting to kind of associate them as part of the taste and not part of the aroma so again it's all to do with the, the overall drinking experience but there's nothing wrong with a good traditional dimple glass i mean it was good enough for the two ronnies it's good enough for me and slurpy dave but going on about glasses and that type of stuff that does kind of bring us on to a nice segue and it brings us on to the sponsors of today's video, which is Kingston Press Cider. Now I know this is a beer review channel, but Kingston Press Cider is a very special cider because cider equals heartburn. And nothing says heartburn more than Kingston Press. I should know most ciders, it takes two to three glasses before I get the devil burn. But with Kingston Press, God, I've hardly swallowed half a glass 
before I feel the pain and surge and burn of indigestion. Kingston Press. As I say to my wife, Kingston Press Cider. Fuck that hurts. Kingston Press Cider. Available in a poncy glass near you. I'm only joking, it's not sponsored. Of course it's not sponsored. Oh, that's rancid, so it is. And it's not even Kingston Press Cider, by the way. I've never even tasted Kingston Press Cider. But I will be honest, I will be honest that after a couple of glasses of cider, it, no matter which cider it is, it gives me hell of a heartburn. It really does give me hell of a heartburn. It just, I, I, I like cider. I mean, obviously... I like certain types of cider and things. I'm not a big fan of the sweet, fruity stuff, but I do like a good cider, but unfortunately I can't drink it because it's just not worth the, the hassle and the pain. And that's all cider. It doesn't matter. I've tried every bloody type of cider, whether it's basically the Breton cider in France, cider in America, hard cider as they call it. I've tried cider in Russia. I've tried cider everywhere. Um, and it just, I don't know, it's just the, the apple stuff. It just gives me really bad heartburn so when I say I'm joking about Kingston Press it doesn't bring me heartburn all cider brings me heartburn but this one isn't even Kingston Press what did a beer review no it's not Kingston Press in the bloody glass never tried Kingston Press what is it it's Norcott's Norcott cider that one When did I get that? Remember that time we were doing all these beer reviews with, or beer reviews, cider reviews with Adrian? Yeah. Remember we were reviewing all the kind of local ciders? We did about 20 of them. Well, yeah, Norcott's, it gets scored a uh, paint stripper out of 10. Not remember. We told you it was absolutely bloody awful. It was a local cider. You don't remember? It was the guy, the guy that basically came with the fancy car in the wellies. He, he was the one that delivered it. Well, you liked it. Oh, I'm fucking surprised there, aren't I? Sorry about that. Can I do my... Pres- oh, hmm. ah, same to you as well. Anyway, sorry about that. But yes. <laughs> Norcott cider. Um, we actually bought 12 bottles of this to do one done kind of tasting review. Because what we're going to basically do is a lot of people come down here for holidays and breaks and that. And what we thought, well... Just to kind of add a bit of kind of uh, local knowledge, we'll get some of the kind of top kind of twenty beat, you know, like top twenty ciders, because um, of course Cornwall, Devon, and especially Somerset are all kind of well known for ciders. It's kind of ciders country down here, and all that. Pop it, you know. So I, we thought we'd do that, and uh, we gave up on it because a lot of the ciders absolutely piss. That's what we managed to find. Norcott's been one of them, but. Funnily enough, a lot of the ciders down here aren't actually made with fresh pressed apple juice. Some of them are basically made from basically concentrate. Some are made from a mixture of fresh pressed and concentrate. And very few are actually made from 100% freshly pressed apples. So there you go. And uh, it's quite noticeable in some of the flavours. And of course, I think that's why they do all these kind of the fruity flavours and all these other kind of strange concoctions is to try and kind of hide the fact that it's not maybe the, the most natural product as it's kind of uh, promoted. So we thought, well, I don't want to be part of the con. So we didn't release it. But we did submit. We've got all the scorings and everything else and that type of stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, there was one there we did actually. It's, it's quite funny because uh, you've got Sanford's, which is quite a popular cider down here. It's actually the other side of Exeter. And it's strange because some of their cider is some of Adrian's favourite ciders. But one of their ciders got a zero from both of us. Um, no mark at all. Um, obviously not as bad as Norcott's, because Norcott's, they got paint stripper out of ten. Yeah, that's the scoring it got. But anyway... Let's do away with the ponty glasses and the... <laughs> if you want to know what I got these glasses for, I was buying stuff for... I'm going to do some homebrew videos just to kind of little tips and tricks to help people with their homebrew. 
and I was buying some kind of just standard kit that people can buy and not, not too expensive kit. So, I mean, it's easy for me to do it with more expensive kit and things like that, but I don't want people to go out and buy expensive kit if they don't have to. So I bought some kind of standard, kind of normal price kit, just a kind of standard starter kit, and I'll do some kind of uh, brews with that and kind of show you some of the tips um, that can improve it um, without really having to do too much and things like that, just to kind of help people out and kind of get them a better product at the end of it. Because again, if it saves money and people can have a nice beer at the end of it, then it's definitely a worthwhile process. But in the meantime, when I was buying it, there are these on sales at 12 glasses, 12 pint glasses for uh, for under a fiver. So I got some and they came with Kingston Press on them. Because the problem is, is the wife and the kids basically, they keep nicking my glasses and then they end up disappearing up the stairs and I don't see them for bloody days. And then when they come back down, they've usually got a nice scum of milk in the bottom or God knows what else. So I bought them so basically people can uh, utilise them and stay off my glasses that I use for reviews. Because there's nothing worse than like, I'll, I'll do a bunch of reviews and you go, oh, fuck, I've not got enough glasses. You're thinking, you buggers, you know, you've screwed me here, you know. And then sometimes I actually have to do reviews and then go away, wash the glasses, dry them and come back. You're thinking, Jesus, just dragging the arse out of the bloody time it takes. But anyway, we're 11 minutes in and all I've done is waffle on and do silly jokes and talk about bloody cider. But let's get on to... The traditional beer in the traditional glass. The problem is it looks bigger on camera, but I always feel that when I fill this glass up, it doesn't feel like you're getting a pint. It always feels like, you know, it's, it's like a baby glass in some ways. But let's smell it. Right, what am I getting? Well, the main smells I'm getting is malt. Definitely a malt-forward beer, like it should be. Getting a little bit of grain. Not really getting hops, which is kind of normal. You really shouldn't get the real smell of hops off a bitter. What you should be getting is the taste of hops off a bittering hops. And for proper kind of bittering hops, not, not sour citrus hops, because that's the difference. Because sour citrus hops hits you on the basically the back of the tongue, whereas traditional English bittering hops should be at the back of the back of the mouth but at the roof of the mouth that's the difference so it should be accents of bitterness at the roof of the mouth at the back not on the tongue if it's on the tongue then it's more kind of uh, american style kind of citrusy hops that would be called souring hops um and of course you get certain souring hops that are used for um european beer styles as well and again they're not going to hit you more in the tongue than on the actual roof of the mouth. So there you go. But yeah, it smells quite nice. It's kind of, I kind of, it's gonna, well, it's kind of clear. It's kind of, let's just see, yeah, it's kind of slightly opaque. I mean, it is kind of clearish, um, kind of chestnut colour, I would probably say. Kind of dark amber chestnut colour for the people in the podcast. It's not completely clear. But as you can see, there's a wee bit of head on it and things like this. And uh, yeah, it looks and smells like it should. So let's have a taste. Wow. Ah. Right. The malt is there. The malt is there. But... Um, As you say, it ain't like gravy. Um, yeah. It's got the bitterness. The bitterness is there. It's got not a bad little bit of bitterness, again, hitting the roof of the mouth, not really in the back of the tongue, like it should do. It's got the malt, especially at the front of the mouth, but it just tends to kind of weaken off a bit in the mid-tongue from what I'm getting initially. But it just is maybe lacking a little bit of body. It could have probably done with a bit more body, especially in the mid-tongue. Um, so it feels like it's a bit on the lighter scale from that point of view. Which, again, I don't mind it too bad because for a lighter kind of bitter, that's not so bad. I mean, a lighter bitter in the summer, nicely chilled, which this is, isn't too bad. 
a lot of times you find that you'll maybe get a little bit more body and just getting a little bit more to it if you actually have it at a warmer temperature. If you have it at a more kind of cast temperature, which is really just like a kind of a chilled room, basically, a bit of a colder room. So usually it's a case as though that's round about the 10 degrees, 10 to kind of 13 degrees is the kind of normal kind of kind of chilled room temperature you're kind of getting um, results on the beer from the point of view when it's kind of pumped. So again, it's not room temperature, um, but it's usually kind of in the, the lower double figures or higher single figures. It's usually the kind of temperature at best. So again, you'll get a different kind of flavour profile. You will get a different action. And I'll do that because I'll show that as... I'm going to purposely do that because... I'm going to do some, uh, is it the, oh God, is it the West Indies Guinness video coming up? And I'm going to show you how they drink, they drink it in Waterford, the traditional way of drinking original Guinness. And I'll show you the difference from that. And temperature makes a big difference because one is drunk in Waterford at room temperature, whereas in Dublin you'll get it as a chilled bottle and things like that. So there's different ways of drinking it and of course you do get a different kind of uh, experience from that point of view. And it's the same with this. I think is this, is, this is probably a bit more watery because it's chilled a bit more. Which is nice for as we're coming into the summer because this is now the start of May. So we're coming into the more kind of warmer months in the UK. So usually with me, I will kind of chill the beer a little bit more just to get a little bit more refreshment out of it from that point of view. But you can lose a little bit of body by over chilling the beer for the type of beer it is. And you will get that little kind of slightly watery kind of effect, but doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, it's actually totally watery, especially with the flavour profiles, because you really work on the basis is if it was really watery, then the flavour profiles would be watery as well, where they're a decent kind of intensity. I'm not saying they're overly intense and things like this, but there's a decent intensity that the flavours are fairly kind of clear from that point of view. And uh, I think, yes, because of how I've chilled it, I've probably taken the edge off some of the body of it from that point of view. But yeah, let's break down the flavours. Nice malt. Um, nice malt flavours at the front of the mouth. A little bit of sweetness, but you're also, funnily enough, you're getting a little bit of grain at the front of the mouth and just a little accents of bitter, just a little accents of bitter, just as it's running down the side of the tongue, basically, from the front of the mouth, and just getting a little accents of bitterness. Moves on to the mid-tongue. That little kind of sweetness is it, it's really is dissipated, really kind of gone in the mid tongue. Again, ever so slight light accents of bitterness, but you've still got the malt there and you've still got a bit of grain. But because I think because of the, the sweetness has kind of died down a bit, and again, you're only just getting very light accents of bitterness, it does feel that it's a bit lighter in the, the mid tongue. And people might think it's probably a bit watery, but there's a bit of that. But it'd be interesting to see that getting more towards room temperature. I'm sure that would kind of lift up a wee bit from that point of view. Because I think some of the flavours are, and the, just the overall mouthfeel is just slightly affected by it being over chilled. Move on to the aftertaste. And you get a little bit of that sweetness coming back in the aftertaste. A little bit, just starts to kind of resurge a bit. You're getting the malt, the grain is kind of died down, and you're getting a bit more bitterness there as well. And again, it's just sitting at the top of the roof of the mouth, just with the kind of malt just sitting underneath it. So that's what it feels like. It feels like the bitterness in the roof of the mouth, and you're just down from that, you're getting that kind of last kind of remnants of the kind of malt flavourings with a little bit of underlying sweetness, just kind of in the bottom of the mouth, at the back. And that's what it's like, kind of tiered. And uh, yeah, it just kind of dissipates nicely, but you're still getting that little bit of light lingering bitterness after you've swallowed. And it's just, it's actually quite nice. And I'm sure that if it was a warmer temperature, 
that bitterness would be a little bit stronger as well from that point of view. So it, it would probably get a little bit more meat on the bones, as I say. But we've kind of damped it down a bit by over chilling. And that is what people need to think of is the cases of, because sometimes it's the cases of, and I might do it with this beer as well at some point, because um, I do have a keg. So what I'll do is I'll maybe dial it up a bit and see what I'm going to get. Because it's sitting at roughly about six degrees. What I'll do is I'll ramp it up and basically have a, a couple of beers with it when it's a bit warmer. And I'm sure it will probably react that way and just give us a little bit more back on the basis of that. But overall, it's actually quite a nice bitter. And it's nice to see that it's done in a more traditional way. Um, I know some people don't particularly like this brewery because of some of their kind of, uh, how would you say, kind of uh, behind the scenes kind of shenanigans and accusations and rumours and everything else and that type of stuff about their business practices and how they're kind of uh, conducting themselves. Again, I've read the articles, I understand the rumours. Again, nothing's really kind of... Um, how would you say nothing concrete has really actually happened to them um, but yeah, there's been plenty of accusations and well they're all alleged at this point nothing's actually been kind of proven and things like this undoubtedly in a court of law or something like that but usually there's no smoke without fire from that point of view so i can understand that uh, if some of these accusations were true then yeah they would need to have a real good hard look at themselves and how they're kind of behaving and acting from that point of view but over and above that it's nice to see because i do tend to kind of keep this more as a kind of craft beer brewery and from that, they're a bit of my radar if I'm looking for more kind of tradition. If I'm thinking about traditional kind of brewed beers and more kind of traditional types of beer, it's off my radar from that point of view, just because of Dry Pure is such a big brand for them and things like this, that I do tend to kind of class it as slightly more crafty than, than traditional. But in saying that, though, it's actually not a bad uh, bitter. It's actually a better bitter than uh, some of the more traditional breweries have produced. And it's nice to see that it's actually a nice level of bitterness there, nice level of malt. Again, I f expect that to ramp up a bit with uh, a warmer temperature. But even at a colder temperature, cooler temperature in this type of uh, warmer environment, it's nice and refreshing and, and very drinkable and very sessionable as well, which is one of the things that you expect. You don't want too much body in a, a bitter because it's got to be sessionable. It's one of these ones you can basically stand at the bar and uh, have a right good night on from that point of view. And enough flavour there to make sure it's all nicely interesting and keeps you coming back for more, but not too overpowering that it becomes sickening or it becomes tiresome from that point of view. So th there's got to be a balance with bitter. It's, it's got to be sessionable, but it's also got to be flavoursome enough to be interesting and everything else. So um, what would I give this out of 10? Um, I think it's going to give more. I honestly think it's going to give a bit more than I'm getting just now. But as the mouth is becoming more acclimatised, the bitterness is still holding strong. There's a nice maltiness to it as well. And I think it would give up a bit more at a warmer temperature. And the body would just be, be a little bit more. But yeah, when it's chilled, it is a bit lighter in the mid-tongue, lacking a wee bit of body. But I think it's a case as though that's down to the kind of chilling it colder than it really needs to be but it keeps it nice and refreshing. And this is one of the things is that some beers don't always react well to kind of lower temperatures, whereas other ones do. There's ones that can take a nice chill and, and deliver nicely at uh, different temperatures, whereas other ones, the, they can lose a bit, especially at the colder temperatures. It just, you know, some of the edge is taken off at, at the colder temperatures and they lose a bit. And I think this is a little bit like that. 
It hasn't lost its flavour, but it's lost maybe a little bit of its body. And it'll be interesting to see if I get some of that back at a warmer temperature. Which I actually think it probably will. Just by going by the, the flavour profiles that are there and the kind of intensity. So on that basis, what would I give this out of 10? Well, it's a nice bitter. I would recommend it. it it's got some nice traditional bitter flavours and profiles. Um... And it acts like a bitter. They haven't thought they'd pull, let's put some different hops in it and fuck about with it. And that they haven't done that. They've been a bit more controlled, which is good. It's nice to see that a brewery, regardless of whether you agree with the business practices or not, nice to see that they understand that, well, we're doing it more traditional, so let's do it traditional, not piss about with it and try and reinvent the wheel. You know, less is more from that point of view. So, yeah, fair play to them. Because you, it'd be too easy because the type of brewery just to kind of keep ramming it home and uh, well let's put some different hops in it and let's over hop it and let's see what concoction we can make from it and then see how wonderful we are because we've done this. They didn't do it and fair play to them for that. I've got to kind of give them a thumbs up for that because it's too many breweries do that, especially from the craft situation. So. After all that waffle, out of 10, I'm going to give this... I'm going to give this a 6.5 at the moment. 6.5 the way it is just now. But I would say it probably would make the 7 if I have it at a warmer temperature. And what I might do is um, I might get some of this in the winter. I'm going to try it myself, but I might review this again as more of a winter drink, you know, more of a kind of a dark beer drink, which I usually drink more of my darker beers in the winter and I get kind of lighter, or I over chill darker beers for the summer and things, which quite a lot of people do. I'm not the only one that does that. But I might do this as a more kind of traditional, bitter, dark beer for the winter, and I'm sure it'll probably give me a bit more. And if it does, then I would say yes, it's probably more likely to be a seven from that point of view. Seven at kind of warmer temperatures, more kind of cascade type temperatures, and uh, six and a half, down to, down to six, six and a half, when it's basically chilled down to kind of six, six degrees, five degrees, that type of stuff. But overall, yeah, it's quite a nice beer. I would recommend it. Now, again, I got this on sale because it was on sale and it was having a, a short kind of shelf life there wasn't much left and it's used by date so it was a few three and a half almost four weeks on the the shelf life of the the keg that i bought so that's why it was cheaper again it's used around about 22 23 quid plus delivery from the brewery but when it's down to about 15 pounds well yeah i would definitely say for that price it, it, it's a good bargain and if you can get it for that price then yeah go for it i would recommend it at 22, 23 pounds, well, it's a different story because it's basically quite a bit more from that point of view. And would I say it was such a, a good buy then? Well, it's a different story, different story, especially in these times. And we will be kind of looking, of, you know, looking at that in the news coming up um, later on this week. Um, there will be um, a kind of look at how the beer industry is being affected and of course just how in general people are basically buying beer under the present climate with prices basically going up, costs going up, everything's going up and unfortunately wages don't seem to be really going up at the, at the same level which seems to be the kind of norm that we're getting nowadays that inflation and prices all around the world things are going up 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 and uh well unfortunately wages and salaries hourly rates whatever just are nowhere near matching it and it's been like this for years whereas we've had downturns before and recessions and everything else and the costs have gone up and uh People's wages just never seem to kind of follow suit. But the great thing is house prices always seem to go up. 
everything else is inflation and uh, we're all supposed to be thankful we're in a job but nobody gets paid what they're really worth and every year we seem to get paid less and less because uh, if you're lucky enough to get a pay rise your pay rise is usually a pittance but again there's even a lot of people just don't even get a pay rise I mean, like, you know when it comes down to basically paying the workers well you know yourself you've all we've all heard it We've all heard the kind of, uh, you know, the bleeding heart stories from management saying, oh, we'd love to give you, but unfortunately the way things are, and things are very tight with the business and everything else and that type of stuff, so we can't really give you anything. We'd love to, but we can't, no, fuck you. You know, it's all that kind of nonsense, and yeah, times are hard, and let's be totally honest, people need a release, and be able to come home and have a beer, and be able to afford it, and have a nice beer. Well, there you go. It's uh, it's not much to ask, and that's another reason why there will be separate videos coming up about home brewing, and uh, just giving some little tips. There will be a little bit of in depth, but there will also be areas where we'll show you how to just kind of improve your home brews very easily without really having to do any, any real extra effort whatsoever and just kind of show you that yes if you're not really into brewing you just want a decent beer for a cheap price without any you know without too much hassle and without basically you know getting right into it and becoming nerdy about it then we're going to show you some of the things about that but we'll also show you some of the things where you can really kind of test out and experiment and we'll show you the ways you can kind of experiment and kind of uh, try making up your own recipes and things like this and, and kind of highlight what's important and what you can get from the different ingredients and what parts they play. So again, there's going to be a few different videos and again, they're going to be separate from the beer reviews. So if people are interested, you can watch them. If you're not interested, then don't bother. Go and do something. Go and drink beer. Don't waste your time watching something you don't want to watch. Go, go and get wired into a good beer, you know, if you can afford it. And... Don't forget, keeps in press. <laughs> this beer is out, this beer, sorry, it keeps in beer. This side is actually out of date. Do you think I should take a drink? I'll tell you, I'll, this is a wee extra before we finish. This ran out on the 12th of the 2nd, 22. So it's over a year out of date. <laughs> and I'll tell you what it says on it. A refreshing apple cider made in the heart of the West Country. Best self chilled. It's not, it just came out. I've still got bottles sitting in the bloody shed, <laughs> taking up space. And it's suitable for, for coeliacs, no artificial colours or sweeteners, suitable for vegetarians and vegans, and contains sulfites for freshness. There we go. Coeliacs, that's better. I'll pronounce that better. There we go. And just to let you know, it's 4.5% and. Uh, it's a premium recipe made from the finest ingredients and it's Norcott Cider Original and seriously it doesn't even particularly smell particularly nice but let's have one mouthful and then basically I can spend the rest of the day in the toilet okay so Jesus God I can actually taste better now than it did at the time No. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Jesus, like crab apples. Fucking hell. Oh, it's gone really sour. Oh. Anyway. Thanks for watching. Cheers. <laughs> and bye for now.